International Program. Gary Lemon. Right, Good to be with you. Good to see you. Welcome. Gary! Uh. What's with the smiley face? We just figured a Stern commissioner's photo. No, the, Stern's the other commissioner. That's, oh, that's right. Oh, well done. Well, thank uh, you. I saw you in, uh, in Winnipeg, uh, and it was great to see the Jets back. And I actually, truthfully, wasn't sure how they were going to react to you. But I was standing there. You were about to do a radio interview on the TSN radio. And all of a sudden, I heard, Gary, Gary. And I turned around going, there must be another Gary. Gary Lawless, who right. was doing the interview. And, <laughs> but it was you. And you got cheered. You sure? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Do you poll the audience? Well, I turned around and saw you, and I went, oh, this is crazy. <laughs> so uh, were, were you, uh, what do you think of the reaction? The reaction was great. Uh, it was terrific to bring the Jets back to Winnipeg. Uh, obviously, you don't like leaving anywhere. We didn't like leaving Winnipeg 15 years ago. But we always knew that the fans in Winnipeg, miss the game, love the game, and when circumstances changed, ownership, building, even the market itself, we were happy to have the opportunity to go back. What's the, um, the biggest misconception about you when you're trying to manage a league, not just one team? <laughs> uh, that smile. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, but, yeah. but, but it becomes a stereotype. Uh, people in the media try to portray, not just me, because I don't want to sound paranoid, people in a certain way because it suits whatever story they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, my, my wife, kids, and grandkids love me. Uh, I'm, I'm not sitting around being miserable or figuring, figuring out ways to, to hurt people or markets. I love the game, which is why I've been doing this for 19 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think people get that. I also think people have a preconceived notion because, you know, I'm from New York and I'm an American and I think certain stereotypes fall into that, and it's okay, I can live with that, uh, because none of this is by way of complaint. I love what I do, yeah. and it's, it's a great job, but more importantly, it's a great sport with great people. And then you come off this summer, which has been a pretty tragic summer. And, tragic uh, and sad. Yeah, really sad. I mean, the, you have the three deaths here, but then you have the plane crash as well yeah. uh, overseas, and um, the debate, it's constant, is about this headshots thing and, and concussions. How are you guys dealing with it? Well. I don't think we get enough credit, and it's not a place we're looking for credit, but we get criticized, I think, when we shouldn't. We've been at dealing with concussions since 1997. We were the first sports league to really begin to address it with our players and doctors and trainers. We were the first sports league to have baseline testing, to have protocols for the diagnosis and return to play decisions. We're dealing with equipment, and we've made a number of rule changes. Uh, most notably this year is we don't allow headshots. If you're targeting the head and it's the principal point of contact, you'll get a penalty and you'll probably get suspended. We're also making sure that players are safer along the boards. And in that in vain, all boards, all glass now is plexi. Yeah. We took care of the turnbuckles with a curved spring-loaded system. So we're working very hard at it. But contact with the head uh, is something you just can't legislate out of the game when you're encouraging physical contact. If it's a full body check yeah. and you happen to have incidental head contact, if you start punishing that, we're going to start looking at a very different game. So we're going to look at the changes we've made. I think Brendan Shanahan is off to a great start in terms of explaining to the players in the world exactly what we're expecting and what we're going to tolerate. And hopefully we're going to see the incidence of concussions come down dramatically. Is it just like, you know, the hits are one thing. I mean, like, headshots are one thing, but the reality is the game is really, really fast, and it's much faster than it's ever been. In fact, even the post-lockout, the most recent lockout, there was a lot of steps taken to make the game more exciting, and it's a faster game. Once you do that, even a seemingly unspectacular hit can cause serious head trauma. The game's just fast. The players are big, the ranks are small relative to them, and is that you just can't take concussions out of the game. Well, but there were concussions before the lockout. They weren't diagnosed as well as they are now. Some of the increase that we're seeing is because we're doing a much better job of diagnosing and handling the medical aspects of a concussion. You know, you go back to Scott Stevens' hits, those, those were devastating and that was in an era, though 99% of his hits would still be legal, yep. uh, but they were legal uh, before the work stoppage. Th this is something where the, there's no magic bullet. What we have done is devoted time, energy, attention, money, to dealing with how to best protect our players because we're all about player safety. I think we're the only professional sports league to actually have a senior executive whose job is all about player safety. Mm -hmm. And this is an evolutionary thing to deal with as the game changes. 
because we're not looking to take the physicality out of the game. But it's a fast physical game played in an enclosed environment, and there are going to be some injuries, and players understand that. That's part of the risk of the game. It's part of the skill that a player brings to the game. How important is it, too, to, to make sure that, I mean, parents want to get their kids playing hockey at a young age, and, and sometimes when they hear these news reports, it scares them off. Well, and that's why we want to make sure that parents know that we're doing everything possible to be safe and it's kind of like the old adage what you see on TV don't try at home although an interesting story my, my five-year-old grandson is playing hockey and he just got his first pair of shoulder pads and he put them on and he was very uncomfortable and he didn't like them and he wanted them off until he started moving around and banging into things and saying you know this is pretty good that's the beginning of understanding yeah. what, what the issue is for sure and I'm sure there's lots of conversations about making the game different and you hear about the different net and the competition committee what's the thing that you really want the owners to to approve I think right now the game's in a very good place we have to monitor the changes to rule 48 the head hits yeah. and the boarding change on rule 41 uh, but the game is great I know for some reason everybody associated with this game and it's because perhaps our fans and our media uh, and the people who work in the game are more passionate than any of the other sports but people are always looking for what can we change what can we criticize games are really in a good place and if you ask most people including most players and former players they'll tell you they don't think the game has ever been better it's an interesting thing you're the only sport that has to deal with the two countries the way you do. I, I mean, we're in the in Toronto. You have the, an NBA team, and we have a Major League Baseball team. That doesn't count. Doesn't count. Yeah. <laughs> in Toronto. <laughs> in Toronto. <laughs> but but that not, I, I don't think in America they talk about us the way we talk about the American influence in hockey for obvious reasons. Is it is it a I th challenge? I, I think that's fair. Uh, I think I have a very good understanding of the way both countries interact. Uh, I love all the time I spend in Canada. To me, and, and you know, in the middle of February, I'll go to Edmonton and Calgary just because it feels good to be there in the dead of winter. Yeah. Uh, but but I, I, I think what, what people in the United States tend to think is, well, Canada's just like the United States, and it's not. It's a different country with a separate culture and a passion for the world's greatest game, unlike anywhere else in the world. And, and I think, there's more attention spent from the Canadian media focusing on the game in the United States than the other way around. I think the U.S. media tends to view it all as just one league, and I think there's more of a focus on Canada and the Canadian teams, which is expected because this is Canada's game. Did you have to learn that about Canadians? Did you, did it, was it different than you thought it would be? You know, I knew it coming in, but until you feel it, the intense, no matter what you expected, and it's pretty much what I expected, but the intensity was, was even greater than you could imagine because you really got to feel it to understand it. Did you, um, just on a personal level, those, I, I mean, I know that you expect it and you're pretty reasonable about the reaction you get. You get cheered in rinks and you'll get booed in rinks, but I mean, you're going to work. I, I, I get cheered and booed? I'm sure you get cheered I, somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, I was the boo part. You mean I get booed? You, 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 you get yeah. earplugs in when you go. That's what? how you do it. You uh, drop a puck and you're not even listening. <laughs> <laughs> you have your headphones in, right? I have puck in each ear. <laughs> is, it, is it kind of hard, though? I mean, you know that your kids and your family watches the game and I know they know what to expect, but it's still their daddy getting booed. Is that difficult? I've been, I've been in professional sports now over 30 years. They get it. They understand that there are burdens to living this life. And it's not just a job, it's a lifestyle. And there are benefits. They go to lots of great events. They've been all around the world. And they understand that the one rule I have is they're not allowed to Google me. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, so you're like, we're talking 20 years, right? Coming up on that. Yeah, which is, well, 19 yeah. February, and we're working on 20. That'd be all right. Um, there's a rumor I heard on the radio that said you were, cons you were trying to get the job to be the commissioner of Major League Baseball. That's that ridiculous. Never true? No, that's another one of those. Who said that? They made it up. They don't, I don't know. Let me, by the way, uh, let me. Let me yes. let let me be more clear instead of being funny and glib about it. Fact is, I love what I do, and there's nothing else I'd rather be doing than what I'm doing. Yeah, that's it. Even when I get booed. Do you think Toronto could support another franchise? You know, I don't know. I, I mean, the answer is maybe. It's not anything we've studied. I know the, the speculation is I have this master list. We don't. We, we, we really try to avoid franchise relocation because we know how painful it is. We just look at Winnipeg and Quebec. Uh, leaving Atlanta was no fun. But in the final analysis, we don't look at two markets and say, we're in this market, but we like this one better. We only leave a market when a team is dead in the water. And the litmus test that I've been using for that is, 
if nobody wants to own a team in a particular place anymore, then you're done. Right. Uh, and so if we find ourselves in a situation where there's another building, uh, if there's an opportunity to either expand or move a franchise, then you look at all your options. You said your grandkids playing at five? Yeah. What kind of player? Uh, he's just, he's skating okay, yeah. you know, as a five-year-old, you know, he's... Do, at they, five, do they have positions he like, yet? He, he loves scoring goals. Does he? And, and he hates when anyone else scores a goal. So he's a, so he's a forward then in your mind? He, he's, a, he's a net hanger. <laughs> do, you, do you ever get to go and watch a game just as a grandfather? Uh, well, I've, I've occasionally will take him to a game in the New York, New Jersey area where, you know, I'll just go in jeans and a sweater and I'll make believe I'm anonymous. I'll, I'll go to his games. I, you know, I used to go watch my son play when he played high school hockey and my son-in-law before he was my son-in-law playing high school hockey. So, you know, we, we get to some local grassroots games. I think Shanahan's doing, Brendan Shanahan's doing a good job dishing yeah. out suspensions. There, there will always be debate about this many games or that many games. I think he's done a pretty good job. You uh, like the videos? Uh, yeah, I think they're good. Yeah. I think, I think it, anything that sort of shows, like, allows us to see his context works for me. Whether or not cool. you agree with it. Absolutely. I, I completely thought the NHL dropped the ball on the Wayne Simmons case. I think him using a homophobic slur the way he did, I think it's too much. You know, and the, I want to know your position on the, that. The, the answer is, you know, we, we had two incidents involving Wayne. Uh, the first one was, was the, the idiotic uh, banana throwing, yeah. and it was, it was inappropriate, it was idiotic. It was uh, completely the, unacceptable. Unacceptable, yeah. and we made that clear. The second is, we, we do, and maybe it's my legal training, we do adhere to due process, natural law. We want to make sure somebody is fair. We didn't have proof. You, you could think, if you're a lip reader, that he said something. Did he mutter it under his breath and nobody heard it? But we but, saw that. You saw but, it, too. You know what? We, we don't punish on we think he did it. Yeah. And, and we made clear that it's unacceptable. We, we made clear to the world that we wouldn't tolerate and don't tolerate that because it's wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, by the same token, we don't micromanage trash talk on the ice, but if we hear it and it's over the line, we'll deal with it. Mm -hmm. If we're 100% certain that it is what it purports to be, we don't guess, we don't say, well, I think that's what he said. And again, nobody on the ice, including the officials, heard anything. So I didn't like it, but under the circumstances, by making clear it was unacceptable, that was more important than whether or not we find them $2,500. Right. What are you most excited about this season? That's the thing that you really think will surprise you. I love the competitive balance, again, that we're seeing. And we're seeing some teams off to a fast start, uh, Toronto being a good example. Uh, we've got some great organizations, great teams, more talent than perhaps we've ever had in the history of the league. And I think that bodes well. But most importantly, you have a regular season game tonight on a Monday night, and guess what? These two points may make the difference in who makes the playoffs, and that's what's terrific about our regular season and our competitive balance. How important is it to the league for Sidney Crosby to come back soon? Well, you, you want all your players, including your very best players, back. You don't want to see anybody injured, but he shouldn't come back until he feels he's ready. That's the most important thing. It's good to see you, man. Great to see you. Thanks for, Thanks for having me. Of course, all the time. The commissioner of the National Hockey League, Gary <laughs> Bettner.